Well, good morning, everyone. Ah, I'm glad that you are here. My name is Michael, and I am one of the pastors here at Cedarbrook, and we are kicking off a brand new message series all about the core values that we hold here at Cedarbrook, about connecting, connecting with God and with other people, uh, about growing, growing together in Jesus, as well as serving, serving our world around us. And today we're going to specifically focus in on connect and This thing about connection is that we really do have a deep need to connect. We have a need to connect with God and with other people, and it's because we're relational creatures. And not only that, we were created for connection, and sometimes it shows up in ways that we didn't even know existed. Back in uh, June, uh, my wife Amanda and I, we went on a retreat in Colorado, which is awesome, by the way. Colorado, I love Colorado, I love the mountains. I'll take a mountain over a beach any day, right? Uh, so we're out there in Colorado, and we rented a Jeep Wrangler. I got a picture of it here. Yeah, we rented a Jeep Wrangler, which I think are always cool. I don't know, I just always like them, so let's, let's rent one. And so then as we're driving around, I noticed that um, people were waving to me. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's nice. Maybe it's just a friendly, you know, Colorado thing. You know, they wave to people. And so, uh, I, but then as I started noticing more and more people waving to me, I noticed something unique about those people waving. They were also driving Jeep Wranglers. I was like, huh, well, that's kind of neato. Is, it, is this a thing? Like, is this a thing going on? Like, people that own a Jeep Wrangler, like, they, they wave to other people that own Jeep Wranglers? Is that a deal? Who owns a Jeep Wrangler? Just raise your hand. Be proud. Yeah, b- by the way, wave to you. Um, yeah, it's super cool. Like, I didn't know that that was a thing. And so I'm like, wow, that is it? So I had to test it. So as we're driving, I see a Jeep Wrangler coming, and before they can wave, I'm like, I'm going to try it. So I wave. Sure enough, they waved at me. Right? And I'm like, I was just giddy and having fun with it and going like, Amanda, this is so fun, right? It's so fun. I I always liked Jeep Wranglers, but now, like, I want to own one. I do. I want to own a Jeep Wrangler just so I can be part of that thing, right? That The thing that connects them. And that's exactly what we're going to see today. We have a deep need for connection. And when we find a way to connect with God and with other people, it's like discovering something we never knew existed. And, and maybe, maybe there's some things where you've tried. You've tried to connect and things that sometimes it went well and sometimes it didn't go well. But I really want us to focus in on what God's intentions were, how God has created us for connection. Now, we're going to dive into Scripture and we're going to trace this theme of connectedness throughout the Bible. So go ahead and grab a Bible. We're going to open it, but... Because we're tracing a theme, it's different than just having one section of Scripture and going through it. We're going to be going through it, the whole Bible. So it may be uh, that you can need a Bible, and you can raise your hand and get a Bible, and you want to follow that way. Or um, what I did is I put together uh, notes of all the Scripture I'm using in the order I'm going with it, so you can scroll right through. As well as if you click on the uh, scripture verse, it'll bring you into the context of the whole scripture. So you're not, I'm not completely crazy, right? You can see how it works. Just go to cedarbrook.info. Take out your cell phone, go to cedarbrook.info, and just scroll, around, scroll down there, and you click on notes, and you'll follow right along with us of where we're going to go to trace this theme of being connected, and how God does this. He's created us for connection. Uh, there's also some fun things in there too. So if you weren't thinking about going to cedarbrook.info and clicking on notes, you probably want to check it out. It's pretty fun. All right, so we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1. We're going to see how God has created human beings for connection with himself and with others. And we're going to see some unique stuff going on here. So here we go. Genesis chapter 1, where God has created everything, and now he's going to create the pinnacle of, of all of creation, human beings, starting in verse 26. Here's what he says. Then God said, let us make mankind or human beings in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the birds and all the things that God has already created, all right? And then verse 27, it continues, so God created mankind or human beings in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, that's plural now, 
Male and female, he created them. So what do we see God doing right here? First of all, did you pick up on the let us thing? All before this, God was just saying, let there be this, let there be that. And now he says, let us do this. Let us. Who is God talking to? Right? Who, who is God talking to? That, that's like the big question of the Bible. And whatever your thoughts are about that, the point is, is God is sharing this responsibility. It's connected with something else. And they're together going to do something. God's the supreme one that's making the decision, but he's sharing that responsibility, sharing that rule and reign with others other than himself to do something, which is what? Create, create a representative of himself, right? Create a human being that is going to be like God. Do you see the connecting piece here? God is connected to something other than him, and we are to be connected with God. And then connected to each other. Do you notice how he's, they slid that in there, right? Created them, human beings, male and female. And together, they get the more full image of what the image of God is supposed to be. And what do all of these things do, right? What, what's the goal here? That these human beings working together are going to rule and reign, we don't use that kind of language, right? We don't talk like that, rule and reign. It's kingdom language. They are, they, this is God's perfect kingdom. The way God would rule and reign is by having these creatures that are created to be connected with God to do things with God. And that is what God's kingdom looks like, which is an amazing thing, something I think we miss out on. Now, if you continue to read, you're going to pick up that there's a time where this doesn't necessarily go well. There's something that's going to be missing. It's going to reinforce this need for human beings to be connected uh, shoulder to shoulder, face to face, not only with God, but with each other. So we're going to scroll down or turn your page to um, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, and we're going to see a problem and then how it gets solved. Verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man or this human being to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. What's the problem? Well, there's a human being that's connected with God, but there's something missing. There's something that's not good. It's a human being that's not connected to another human being. And, and can this human being do something about it? Nope. Apparently, God has to step in and do something for this human being that the human being can't do for themselves. That is actually the definition of this word helper that's used here. The word helper here means someone that does something for you that you can't do for yourself. And that's exactly what's going on here. Right? This human being's alone but can't solve that problem by themselves, so God is going to do something for this human being that they can't do for themselves. In fact, that's one of the biggest ways that this gets used throughout the Bible, is that God is my helper, okay? So God is the one that's helping me to do things. Now, you read the story, and you see that God is going to create this human being, right? This female that's going to be with this male, and you see this perfect image of that, just like we read in chapter 1, right? So we see the fullness of this. Now they get to be like God in this place and rule and reign the way that God would by caring for the environment that they're, they're a part of and uh, cultivating it so it can be more fruitful and, and also caring for each other, right? It's, it's a both and. They are connected with God and they're connected with each other. Now, with that being said, any piece of that that breaks down, the whole thing breaks down. Here's what I mean. So if we decide that we don't need God, God isn't our helper. God is not the one that does something for us that we can't do for ourselves. If we decide we don't need God, we're not going to be connected with God, the whole thing falls apart. We, we no longer can be like God. We are no longer fulfilling that, that image of God. We're no longer part of that kingdom of God. We've taken ourselves right out of that. That's exactly what happens in the next chapter, right? These two human beings 
start to see that they don't need God and they are going to decide for things for themselves. That leads to the next breakdown. They no longer trust each other. They no longer feel that they need the other person. That other person doesn't do something for me that I can't do for myself. And now what do they do with that? Instead of ruling and reigning the way God would over this creation, they start trying to rule and reign over each other. It is not God's kingdom. And now throughout the rest of the scripture, you're going to see that played out over and over and over again. People that are disconnecting from God and worshiping other gods and other things and people disconnecting from each other and trying to rule over each other and fighting and all of that. And you get some glimmers of, of human beings connecting with God and with other people, and it's, and, and it's successful. It's a good thing. You start to see God's kingdom show up in that way. But over and over, you see this disconnection. And I think that is the world in which we live in. We live in this world where we can get burned by trying to connect with other people trying to be vulnerable and putting ourselves out there and trying to be shoulder to shoulder with them or connect with them face to face. And, well, that can cause harm, right? We get ruined by that. They try to rule over us in some way. And now what do we do? Well, we don't trust each other. We decide we don't need that, right? The fact that we try to convince ourselves that we don't need connectedness shows us that we really need to be connected, right? Because all my, the mental energy, emotional energy put into saying, I don't need anybody else, just is revealing the deep need that you have. It's like a defense mechanism. Thankfully, it doesn't end with this. God is going to step in again for all of humanity, for all of us, to do something for us that we could not do for ourselves, and that is to become like us, and to be here with us. That's where we end up in Matthew chapter 1. We see Jesus being born. And it is God coming to be like us so that we can be like him. Right? And Jesus' name is called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Doing something for us that we can't do for ourselves. And what Jesus does is he starts connecting people to himself. Right? God with us. He starts connecting people with himself. And some really strange people that would never connect with each other outside of Jesus. They wouldn't. They would never spend time together. You ever look at the disciples that Jesus picks and just really look at who they are? Because they, they would never associate with each other. Let's take a look. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 has a list of these disciples, or it's called apostles here. And we're just going to, I'm just going to point out a few things. And, and this, these are things that are only separating them, but yet they're united and connected with Jesus and with each other. Verse 2 of chapter 10 of Matthew. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Now, those four, you could see that they would get connected because they're all fishermen. They, they fish together. It's like they own a fishing business together. That's their livelihood. And these loud mouth, blue-collar, working fishermen are going to be in this group with this rabbi, this teacher, this educated person. Like, it just seems like it doesn't mix, and yet that's the very thing that unifies them as we learn about more of these people. So, we, verse 3, we have the first name out of the gates is Philip. Now, that may not seem like any big deal to us, but the rest of them have been Jewish names. Philip is a Greek name. It's outside of that Jewish culture. So, here's somebody that, yeah, they might do business with and things like that, but to come and sit at the feet of this rabbi and to learn and connect with God, that seems a little bit odd. It gets weirder. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, who's going to be later known as this doubter, doubting Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector. Why did they put that info in there? The tax collector. Matthew is a Jewish man collecting taxes from his Jewish brothers and sisters and then taking that money, making a living off of it, and then paying this Roman government, their share. 
he doesn't fit in the world of the Jewish people and he doesn't fit in the Ro world of the Roman people. He's in between. They wouldn't look at him in a kind way. They would disassociate from him. He's a sinner. He wouldn't be part of this group. You see what I'm saying? They would not associate with him outside of being connected with Jesus. It gets even worse. So there's uh, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and then Judas Iscariot, who is going to betray Jesus. Okay? So you've got, sure, we've got the betrayer right in there. We can see, like, that's kind of crazy. You brought somebody in who's going to betray you, turn their back on you, hand you over to the authorities to be killed. That's part of your group. But think about this guy, Simon the zealot. We talked about God's kingdom. Do you know how he is going to see bringing God's kingdom into this place? To kick out the Romans, who Matthew works for and collects taxes from the fishermen. <laughs> These loudmouth individuals. You see, this is just a crazy, strange group of people that would never come together. And yet that's exactly what God's kingdom is like bringing all of these people together, unifying them in connecting with God and then connecting with each other. That is the image of God at its best. And they do some great things. In fact, if you keep reading Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is going to take this group of people that would never associate with them, the, the, the group of people that he came to be like so that they could be like him, he's going to send them out to be like him. He's going to send them out to go and cast out demons and heal people and preach this good news and all of that stuff. They're going to be doing it all because they're connected to him. And now they're doing this shoulder to shoulder, face to face stuff together. That's the kingdom of God. That's what God was doing from the very beginning. That's how we rule and reign together by being connected with God and connected with one another. And it becomes a beautiful picture. In fact, as you read in Acts, we're going to skip to Acts chapter 2. We're going to see it at its best, right? This group of people at its best. After Jesus has died and risen again, and he sends them out to do this stuff, and they start talking with people, more and more people that are becoming part of this kingdom. They're being connected through them. Acts chapter 2, verse 43. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They were being part of the kingdom. They were seeing that their connectedness is found in Jesus and with each other. It's like something they never experienced before. It's like my experience with that Jeep Wrangler. Like, man, once I got connected to it, let's do it. I'll sell stuff to be a part of this thing, right? I'll get rid of stuff if I need to. If you could be part of this kingdom of God, I'll do whatever it takes. And you do the same for me because we see that as a connecting with God. That's how we rule and reign together in God's kingdom. Isn't that fantastic? I mean, that's the thing that I want to be a part of. It's not always that way. As we see, the church kind of starts unwinding a little bit. Different people start seeing the differences that they have and ways that they're going to start disconnecting. And do we really need this group of people? Do we really need that group of people? And they need to be reminded that they are to be like Jesus. And to be like Jesus means they bring this connectedness to Jesus and to one another. That's what they need. Hebrews chapter 10 um, will do this. And, it, and here's the cool thing about this. Um, you might think I'm crazy. I probably can't deny it. But in Hebrews chapter 10, there's not only a connection back to Acts chapter 2, but there's a connection all the way back to Genesis 1 that we looked at. You want to see this? This is really cool. I thought this was really fun. This is uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse uh, 23. And they're being reminded what they're supposed to do, okay? Verse 23, let us, 
hold unswaveringly. No, don't veer from one way or another. Don't do that. To the hope we profess, for he, God, who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. The day is meaning Jesus' return. So that day. Did you see the connections? Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. What are the connections? They're meeting together. They need to remind you, keep meeting together. Encourage each other to do these good things. Maybe that's caring for each other. It's selling stuff so someone that's without can have this stuff. That's God's kingdom, remember? Let's do that. Let's not give up on our meeting together. We need to stay connected face to face and shoulder to shoulder. That's God's kingdom. Did you see the connection back to Genesis 1? Not only is this God's kingdom, but let us do this. Huh? Let us, it says it two times. It's undeniable that they're making this reference back to the beginning of creation, what we were intended to be, how we were created for connection. We need to be connected with God, and we need to be connected with each other. If any of those things break down, the whole thing falls apart, and we're no longer part of the kingdom of God. You want to be a part of this kingdom of God, right? You want, you want to live this out? Let's remind each other that we need, to, we need each other. There's things that you can do for me that I can't do for myself, and there's things that I can do for you that you can't do for yourself. And, of course, there's God that does everything for us that we can't do for ourselves, right? We, we probably are people that would maybe never associate outside of these walls, and yet this is God's kingdom coming together. Now, I don't know about you, but... Being someone that can help someone else, I like that. I like being able to help someone else, right? I'm not so good at being helped, right? It feels weak or I need someone else. Like, I, I don't like that feeling. But if we can get past that, we get to experience something that maybe some of us have never experienced before in their entire life. And that's God's kingdom of people that are connected with him and connected with each other. Would you like to know some ways to connect? There's some ways that you can do to this, that you can connect with God and with other people. And I'm going to give you a few ways that we do it at Cedar Brook here because these are our core values. You're going to see this connected to God and other people in the things that we do. And so here's three practical steps that you can make if you want to be a part of connecting with God and connecting with other people. Excuse me, other people. Here you go. The first one is we have a very easy one. Discover Cedarbrook. You get to discover Cedarbrook. What, what makes Cedarbrook tick? You get to meet staff and pastors here that you can learn how they connect with God and with other people, as well as sharing how you connect with God and other people, right? Because we're part of that together. So go, go ahead and sign up for Discover Cedarbrook on October 1st. It's just coming up. That's a great first step. Maybe you're looking for a little bit more. You want to do a little bit more than just discover Cedarbrook. Great, we have it. Do some groups or small groups. We have a table out there that you can go and meet with real leaders of small groups, real people, and connect with them and seeing how they connect with God and with other people and how you can be a part of that. There's some amazing leaders out there that are doing great Bible studies Go in and check that out. Take that step to be connected. You might experience something you never knew existed. Or the third thing that you can do, this has to do more with shoulder-to-shoulder type of things, right? Going out and serving. Go to our Yes board that's down in the, in the lobby. We have a Yes board there. You can take one of the things that we need volunteers for and fill it out, and you can start serving with other people. It's a great way to connect with God and with others. In fact, that's a way that you can do something for Cedarbrook that Cedarbrook can't do it for itself. Cedarbrook can't serve all by itself, right? His stuff doesn't happen all by itself. It takes you. The point is this. There's many ways that you can get connected back into God's kingdom. Be a part of connecting with God and with other people and experiencing God's kingdom like never before. Will you take that step? I pray, I pray that you do. In fact, I ask you 
and invite you to pray that God would show you how to start building his kingdom right here through you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for coming to be like us so that we can become like you. Help us, help us to draw close to you and connect with you so that we can be a part of building your kingdom right here in this place. Jesus, we ask that you would connect with us to build your kingdom here. Amen.